Well, welcome back to my studio. Today, I talk about how I went from doing work like this to the work that, uh, that I do now. It, uh, it wasn't an easy journey. It was an 18-year process. Um, and if you want to see how that happened and how I went from once again being a struggling artist to a very successful artist, then you should stick around for today's episode. I thought it was only fitting that we start today's uh, vlog with uh, having the background, uh, the piece that really started it all for me. So this is a uh, print of the painting that I did of the Toronto Maple Leafs that's sitting behind me. Um, and this was, the, this was the painting, so this was 1994 that I did this. Um, and this was the painting that really started to get me thinking seriously uh, about painting again. So you can see my skill set was already really well developed uh, back then. And so I finished off yesterday with uh, having made the decision that I was going to leave the police force to paint full time. Um, but I need to back up just a little bit before that to that trip to Bowen Island because a couple things happened there that were really, really influential on my development as an artist. Um, as I said, I made a number of friends there and one of them was Ed Shawcross. He was at the time the current president of the society. And we had a conversation and Ed mentioned something about the difference between process mode and product mode. Uh, and I had never heard, heard of this before and had no idea what he was talking about. And so he explained it to me. He was saying that when we paint, we're either in product mode or process mode. And in product mode, we're focusing on the, the, the concepts, the skills, the techniques, uh, the subject matter that we're confident and competent in, uh, and that will usually get us to our best work uh, as far as where we are right now. But the problem with this, if you just stay there, your work will never grow. But the other mode that we work in is process mode. And in process mode, that's where you're trying new things. Uh, you're trying new techniques, you're trying new concepts, you're kind of playing the what if game. What if I did this? What if I do that? And when you're in process mode, uh, that's where breakthroughs can happen. And that's where you learn things that you can add to that skill set. So that when you spend time in process mode, when you go back to product mode, you now have more skills, concepts, techniques, and, and things that you are good at. So your product level will keep going up. But the one thing that's really important to know about process mode is that when you're in process mode, you're flying by the seat of your pants. You don't know what you're doing. So a large percentage of the paintings are going to fail and they're supposed to fail. And that is huge because often what happens for artists is they try something new and it doesn't work out. And then they maybe try it again and it doesn't work out. So then they scurry back to their comfort zone or product mode, and then they end up staying there for the rest of their life. And I'm sure we all know people that, you know, we saw their paintings 30 years ago and they were just moderately competent, somewhat pleasing paintings. And they've been painting for 30 years and they're still doing the same thing. There's been no growth whatsoever. So that was a huge thing for me, um, that whole idea of getting into um, spending time in process mode to continue to push uh, your knowledge, your skills, and your abilities. Oh, there goes my glasses again. So that was one of the big things that happened. Another thing that happened is, again, just with uh, making so many friends there, um, and at the time I was president of my local art association, uh, and a number of the people that were at the Bowen Island Symposium, so Linda Kemp, Tony Batten, Ed Shawcross, uh, they were at, at um, Les Tibbles, they were on the board of the society. And by the end of the, the week, they had kind of already uh, recruited me to stand for election to come onto the board. And it was kind of funny because I thought, what do I know? I'm just a brand new member here. Um, what do I have to offer? Uh, and then since then, I realized having spent a lot of time on boards that basically all any board is looking for, first of all, is warm bodies who are willing to do, and, do something and help. So if you are a member of your local group or a bigger group, I really would encourage you to get involved. Um, but they also saw that I was the president of my local group, so I, I, I showed that I had that kind of uh, history of being involved and, and working uh, with a group. 
Plus, I realized later it was like this society is fairly old in terms of the average age. Um, but they looked at me and it's like, wow, he's big and he can carry stuff, which is always important when you're talking about hanging shows um, or any sort of work with, a, with an art organization. So when I came back from that trip, um, I, I came out to a couple of the board meetings and stood for election the following year. Um, and again, I had that idea of process, uh, spending time in process mode uh, in my head. So I left the police force, I started painting full time, and I was painting portraits. I had a steady um, backlog of portraits to do that mostly was still people that I had worked with. Um, but then gradually, it just kept getting wider and wider, um, the kind of word of mouth referral. And I still had at this point a... Um, a no money down, no um, kind of requirement to buy. Uh, my thoughts was if I couldn't produce a portrait that someone would love to have, then I didn't deserve to sell it. So I was very busy. My prices gradually started going up, um, but I was still not making a lot of money. When I get, get talked about that whole idea of your hourly wage kind of not being very high, uh, I was thinking about this the other day. It's kind of like, you know, the first few years when you move into painting professionally, you have to think of it like you're playing uh, NCAA in a sport. Uh, if, you're, if you're playing for a university down in the States, you can be playing at the highest level and you're kind of working towards your future, but you're not making any money at that point. You have to kind of put in the time until you actually start making the big bucks and playing in the pros. And I think starting as, a, as an artist, when you first start painting and, and selling your work, it's the same thing. You're kind of putting in that time to get good enough and to find your voice um, where you can start earning a good living. So I was doing lots of portraits uh, in watercolors and in oils. And then I was elected to the board and started attending the board meetings. And that that led to an eight year period where I stayed on the board of the Canadian Watercolor Society, eventually um, becoming vice president for two years and then president for two years. Uh, and I look at that time as basically getting my master's in how to become a professional artist because I was rubbing shoulders with some of the country's best artists and I was just a sponge. I was just sucking up all the information I could and I was watching what are the things that these people, the people that are succeeding, what are the things that they're doing and what are the things that I need to be doing. Um, and so that's what I did over the course of the next um, 10 years, basically. But after about uh, two years, uh, something funny happened. Well, it wasn't funny at the time. Um, I mentioned that when I first started painting, I was painting portraits of my boys. And I loved painting portraits of my guys. Um, and gradually, I started doing commissions for other people. And initially, when I was doing the commissions, because they were kind of on, totally on spec, I would shoot the shots, determine the pose, determine the lighting, and just take what I thought was a great image and turn it into a great painting. But as I started doing more and more and more portraits, people started getting more and more um, having their vision of what they wanted uh, into the mix. Um, and then I realized that about the end of two years of uh, painting portraits that John Singer Sargent was right, that a portrait is a likeness with something wrong with the nose, uh, where you finish the painting and it's like, oh yes, that's nice, but could you change this or could you change that? And I found myself doing paintings I didn't really want to do. Um, and then gradually that got to the point where I hated painting portraits. I would rather go cut the grass or do laundry um, than paint a portrait. And I thought, what? oh my God, like what have I done? Here I've quit my job, I've cashed in my pension, and now I've found myself doing something I don't even really like to do. Uh, and it just, it was really, really disturbing. Now I was still at this point um, dabbling in landscape and trying a bunch of different things um, in landscape. I had had a um, workshop with Zoltan Zabo, uh, two workshops actually with Zoltan Zabo in the first couple of years um, that I was painting full time. And if you don't know him, you should Google him. He's like one of the gods of watercolor. Uh, and I watched him paint 
Um, and he started painting. He would paint on a full sheet of watercolor, starting on wet paper, uh, no pencil lines, just going in on wet paper. And within an hour and a half, he would have a gallery quality full sheet watercolor painting that was just absolutely breathtaking. Uh, and, and I thought that's how I want to paint if I'm going to paint landscape. I didn't want to paint um, portraits of the landscape. I knew that. But I also didn't know how I wanted to paint the landscape. And he said something to me, again, one of those turning points. Uh, he said to me, Tim, he said, you know, I've seen your work. And he said, when you can paint watercolor portraits to the level that you do, you can paint anything realistically. Um, there's nothing you can't paint if you can do people that well. And he said, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's a valid choice. But just make sure if that's what you end up doing, that it is in fact a choice, that it's not something you just kind of fell into. Um, and he said, but wouldn't it be great if you could create a world on paper or on canvas that's unlike anybody else's world? Uh, and wouldn't it be sad if we never got to see it because you never thought to look for it? And that, that just blew my mind. And it was exactly what I needed to hear. Um, and that really got me thinking about that, about, yeah, I, I don't just want to be a high realism painter. I realized that up until now, for me, it had all been just about improving the skills, just improving the skill set, um, which, which was involved in painting portraits. But then once I got there, I realized every painting had pretty much painted itself before I started. I knew what it was going to look like. It was now just 25 or 30 hours of execution. Um, and then again, that whole dissatisfaction with painting paintings other people wanted me to paint. I just started my, finding myself drifting more and more to landscape. So I started doing more landscapes and I was doing still lifes as well. I did a number of pieces of flowers uh, and I actually really enjoyed them and they did very well. But I was in that situation still where it was my portraits that were commanding kind of a fairly high price and my landscapes and my florals uh, were a much lower price and kind of just realized after a while that, you know what, the portraits is what I'm really, really good at. Um, and even though I really would like to paint something else, uh, if I'm gonna earn a half decent living, I'm gonna have to stick with the portraits. Uh, and I actually said this to a number of my friends who were in the Canadian Watercolor Society, and these were all experienced artists, uh, who, again, further along on the career path than I was, people whose opinion I really respected. And they all kind of agreed with me and said, you know what, that's probably the wise choice. You know, you've taken this huge plunge um, and, and financially it's kind of like you've got to do whatever it takes to earn a decent living. And so I was prepared to do that until I had a fateful conversation with Neville Clark. So Neville was the president of the Canadian Watercolor Society at that time, and we had become really good friends. Uh, I was vice president under him, and he actually kind of lived near me. So when we would go to board meetings every month, I would pick him up and we'd drive in together and drive home and we'd talk about our, our careers and our work. Uh, and Neville was probably at that time the person I respected more than anyone else in the world um, in terms of his thoughts about art and his advice uh, and he is one of he's one of Canada's best figurative watercolor painters that there is and probably that there was uh, never was he's right up there at the top and he's won every award that possibly you could win in Canada for watercolor painting uh, and just hugely knowledgeable about art also uh, amazing amazing creative integrity um, and so Neville and I, we would always talk about what was going on. And as I said, I, I kind of always looked to him about where I wanted to be in five years. So we were driving home from a board meeting one day. And when I'd kind of, I'd, you know, I'd realized that I really don't like painting portraits, but I'd made the decision that this is what I have to do. And so I said the same thing that I had said to a number of other artists that I just have to suck it up and paint portraits because nobody's ever going to, you know, value my landscapes as much as my portraits. Uh, and I just have to accept that. 
and there was silence. Um, and it was funny, you could almost like feel the temperature go down in the car. And I was actually driving at the time on the 401 and I could literally feel him just staring daggers at me. And so I looked and sure enough, he just had this, this horrible look on his face and this piercing look. Um, and I said like, what, what's the matter? Um, and you have to realize too, Neville is probably one of the most uh, gentle, um, mild mannered people I've ever met. He's an, he's an extremely nice man. Um, and Neville said, Tim, I'm disgusted with you. <laughs> I was like, what? And he said, I, I had such respect for you as an artist um, and, and for your, you know, your, your ambition and your drive and where you were going to be. But now I'm just like having to totally rethink that. I can't believe those words came out of your mouth. He said, if you want to paint landscapes, then paint landscapes. But what on earth made you think it would be easy? Um, and, he, and he said to me, he's like, have you put anywhere near the amount of work into getting good at landscapes that you have into getting good at portraits? And the answer was obviously no. Um, and it's like, you know, I know you sweat blood over your portraits, but your landscapes are just something you're dabbling in. Like, if you want to do this, then you need to do the work, but you should be able to do this. Um, and then he said something to me and I, I tell this story all the time and I know he hates that I tell this. So this time Neville was one of the top figurative painters in Canada. Uh, and he said to me, he said, I paint figurative work because that's what I want. He said, I know if I wanted to paint abstracts, I could win the Casson medal in two years with an abstract, but I would bust my butt and sweat blood over getting good at it. And that's what you need to do with your landscapes. And it was like exactly what I needed to hear at that moment. Um, and that's the other thing that I kind of want to stress about that whole idea of getting involved with art associations and other artists and hopefully artists who are better than you and further on the career path than you, because sometimes they just give you really good advice and sometimes they give you a swift kick in the butt when you really need it. And this was one of those times. So I, I decided right then and there, I was going to throw myself into painting landscapes. So I got home and so I told Diane about the conversation and I said, from now on, I'm just painting landscapes. And she said, no, you're not. You've got all these portrait commissions lined up to do. And again, this is about being in the best financial interests of our family, not about you being fulfilled. So if you want to play over here with the landscapes and work on that, that's fine. But you are still going to continue to do portraits to bring money in. And so I agreed, that's what I would do. So then came about a period so this was probably about 2002 the end of 2002 so almost three years in um, to painting full-time and at this time too even though i was doing the portraits i was still only making about 18 20 thousand dollars a year because my prices were still low um, now what happened over the course of the next year is my portrait prices started going up and up and up, especially as I wanted to do them less and less. I just kept raising the prices. Um, but then I spent about half my time in process mode. Um, and when I say process mode, I mean full blown process mode. I tried everything. I, every medium, every stylistic approach I, from absolute total abstracts to, to very abstracted watercolors to collage. And I gradually came upon um, this style of painting, um, the very, very influenced by Zoltan Zabo initially, and then kind of took it off on my own, um, involving negative shapes and watercolor. And these were all done without any pencil drawing, just painting on the wet paper and gradually carving out shape after shape after shape with glazes. Um, I also have to give a shout out here to Linda Kemp. That's another thing that happened on that symposium at Bowen Island. I had never really fully understood the concept of negative shapes. Uh, and Linda in a 10 minute demo just flicked that switch and turned that light on. Then there was a huge change in my work where negative shapes all of a sudden became, you know, part of everything that I was doing. If you don't know what that is, you should check out uh, my video on shapes. I go into great detail on positive and negative shapes. So I was, I developed this kind of abstracted uh, watercolor style that was actually fairly popular. It was really popular with artists. 
uh, because oh, I was also teaching at this time. I'd started teaching workshops, uh, and so I taught portraits in watercolors, portraits in oils. Then I started teaching, you know, beginner level watercolor classes, and then I started teaching this kind of abstracted uh, watercolor, and then com and then composition. So I was doing any teaching gig that I could get, but between all of the commissions, all of the teaching gigs, um, and selling whatever kind of landscapes and florals that I could, uh, I was still barely making like $20,000 a year for the first four years, really. Um, and then in 2004, um, the, my current style, it started to kind of peak out. Um, and I was literally painting a different style every painting, just trying to find my voice. Um, one of my friends, Shell Orling, actually asked me, <laughs> half kidding, half serious, if I was schizophrenic, because he said there's like 50 artists. Every time I see you, it's a different artist that's painting. And I just said, I'm just trying to find where I need to go. And it gradually got to the point where I said, okay, I'm, I'm heading in the right direction. And then it's like, okay, I'm in the right neighborhood right now. And that was in around 2004 when I started doing a lot of art festivals. And I started doing fairly well there. And I was still showing portraits. I was still taking on portrait commissions. Uh, I was doing landscapes. I was doing some of the florals. Um, and I was doing these abstracted watercolors. Uh, and what I realized was that watercolors are really, really not meant for doing art festivals, especially ones that are outdoors, because there's just so many issues you have to be concerned with about if, the, if you get light on the glass, it gets condensation behind and that can, that can kind of drip onto the painting. If, if it's windy and it blows a painting off, then your frame breaks and your glass breaks. If, if it rains, you gotta be concerned about your work getting wet. Whereas the oils, and at this point I was just painting on gallery wrap canvases and just painting the sides black um, so they were pretty indestructible you know if it didn't matter if they were in the sun didn't matter if they got wet if they blew off my my racks in my tent I just pick them up dust them off and put them back so I realized that I was that if I was going to continue doing these festivals um, that I was probably best to stick with oils now this time too I was showing in maybe three three galleries uh, but not having a lot of success in terms of sales with them. And when this new work started coming out, again, that was kind of on its way to where I am now, there was an immediate feedback. I started getting sales to where I was doing, you know, 2,000 or 4,000, or I think on the odd festival where I did like 6,000 in sales uh, in a weekend. Um, and that, that year, I think I did in the summertime, I was doing a festival every other weekend pretty much. Um, I also started to see sales in the galleries that I was in with the oil landscapes. Uh, and that year, I actually ended up making $30,000 for the first time. And that was my fifth year um, of painting full time. And I remember Diane and I, because at this point, um, I, always, I always kind of felt that my suit was chasing me. Every time I sold a painting, that got me a little bit further ahead of that suit because I knew it was getting close to the time where we were going to have to have the talk about whether or not this was going to be in our best financial interest. Uh, and so I knew it was getting close and I was feeling really, really desperate. So the fact that I was doing these festivals and getting these sales, like I, again, I, I would be out at five o'clock in the morning at the site, setting up my tent, put all my work up, you know, do my sales for the, and then take the tent down and then off to the next place. And I just thought I'm going to do whatever I have to do so that I don't have to put that suit back on. And so I kind of realized by the end of that year that I, I was finding my voice or my voice was finding me um, these, these landscapes in oil where I loved the process of painting them. I loved the finished work and the public was starting to show me some love that they loved the finished work as well. And that year, I had a friend of mine, uh, Shell Orling, uh, who was on the board of the uh, Burlington Arts Center, and he asked me to put a couple pieces into their annual charity auction. Now, I'd done a number of charity auctions up until this point, and they were all the same. You know, it's like they're looking for artists to give them work. People that are there are looking for a bargain, 
and what's going to happen is your work is going to sell for less than it's worth. Uh, and that's usually the case at these things. And I just said, Shell, I'm done with the whole charity thing. Like I don't get anything out of it. Not only that, the charity is only getting a fraction of, of what the piece is worth. And so he said to me, no, the Burlington Art Center one's different. It's like Robert Bateman actually was, was the founder and donated a lot of money for this center to be built. And he still submits an original painting every year. Uh, and he said, we get serious collectors come out that pay, are willing to pay top dollar. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Um, and so I had to paint two paintings for this charity auction. And one of them was the very first painting I ever did with the sun in it. So it was a winter scene with the sun shining through. Um, I'd actually been out to the area near Lake Ontario called the Lynn Marsh to shoot a bunch of photos of the marsh um, because m one of my local galleries wanted to do a show with a bunch of landscapes of the Durham region. And I took all these photos of the marsh and then as I was walking back, I just, I saw the sun poking through the trees and I just turned and took a picture, um, not even really thinking about it. And when I got home and I looked at all my images, that was the one that just kept drawing me. Um, so I, I didn't know, I had no idea how I would go about painting that, but I thought, okay, I'm gonna try with the style that was kind of evolving to paint that. And then I painted another scene, um, just kind of a very abstract mosaic type painting of my first trip to Lake Superior Park, which had happened the previous fall. So I did these two paintings and I submitted them um, to the auction. Um, and then I got called the next day to find out that the, the big piece, the winter piece sold for $3,200 and the small piece sold for $1,600. Um, now at this time, that was more than double what I was charging for works of that size. So that got me really, really excited uh, that, that I'd never sold any, any uh, landscapes for this, this amount of money before. And at the same time, one of my, the local gallery that I was in, the owner, Anthony Von Pileski, he just kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me, telling me I had to do the Toronto Art Expo. So this was a big indoor art festival at the Toronto Convention Center, um, and it costs a lot of money to get in, um, but they get a lot of people there. And he, he was just absolutely in love with this new work that I was doing. Uh, and he said to me, Tim, you've, you've just, now you've just got to get it out in front of people. He says, if you get it out in front of people, I guarantee you, you'll do well. Um, so anyways, this show was going to cost about $3,600 to do. Um, as I say, it was getting close to crunch time um, with Diane and I about the whole idea of whether or not this was something that I was going to be able to continue to do. Every painting that I sold you know, it just gave me a little bit longer before the talk. And we'd had that ar arrangement from the beginning that, you know, I, I had to support my art career. So was, Diane had a very good job um, with one of the big banks and she supported the family. Um, but I was still just barely supporting the costs of, of running my career. Um, and I didn't have any money in my account and I had to put that the whole fee on my business visa. So it was like $3,600. Um, and I knew that this potentially could be the straw that broke the camel's back. If I didn't make my fee back uh, after this show and had a $3,000 balance on my card, um, I might be putting my suit on and going to get a job. Um, but I thought, you know what? I, I really believed in the work that I was doing. I was getting such positive feedback that I, I paid my fee and signed on for the show. And then I just painted my butt off. For the next month and i already had a number of pieces that i'd been doing um, so i showed up at, at the toronto art expo you know i set up my booth uh, the show opened at 11 o'clock on a thursday morning uh, by 11 15 i'd made my booth feedback so in the first 15 minutes of the show i did like four thousand dollars in sales um, diane came down for the opening she got there about five o'clock uh, in the evening by then i was already at ten thousand in sales and by the end of the opening night, I had 15,000 in sales. Um, and I was running out to my van, like bringing more work in, just bringing more work because I, the stuff was selling and it was going and I was just bringing more work in. Um, and I just knew um, that this was it, that I had found my voice and that other people loved it as well. I still remember going home that night. We were driving home on the Don Valley Parkway. And I said to Diane, remember this moment. I said, 
this is this is the day everything changed like we are never ever again going to wonder is this something i should be doing and worry about you know uh, about me selling work or about me being able to earn a living. I said, like, this is the day our life changed. Uh, and she looked at me and she said, you can't know that. And I said, no, I do. I, like the response to the work was just so overwhelming. I knew. And over the course of that weekend, I, I did $28,000 in sales uh, in four days. Uh, I could have done a lot more if I had more work. I basically, I was getting stuff out of the basement that I had kind of thought was B quality and not, not worthy of being seen. Um, but I had hardly any work at all left by the end of the show. Uh, and so I knew. So that was in March of 2005. Um, and I've never looked back since then. Um, it, it's... It, it's been a, a very long ride. Now, I've still continued to paint almost every single day since then. Uh, I still continue to work to improve my work. Um, but the style that kind of started evolving uh, in 2004, 2005 is still the way that I paint now. Um, and since then, it's been very much a business and marketing learning experience. As I, as I grew my business from that, that year of the Toronto Art Expo, that was the first year I made $50,000 in a year. Um, and now it's many, many times that. Um, and that's a whole other story about the whole business side of thing of once you find your voice, how you ride that wave uh, to, to, to capitalize in it, to be able to earn a decent living. So the good news is as well, Diane was able to retire at 49. So she left the bank at 49. She works for me full time now. Um, although she does get a lot of golfing and she got 97 rounds of golf in uh, last year. Um, but she does all the books and the administrative side of things. My son Cameron uh, worked part time for me while he was in university getting involved in the publishing side of the business. And now he works full time for me uh, doing the publishing as well as doing a lot of the video stuff um, that I've been doing over the last week while he's in Cuba. And again, my career just kept going and until I reached another kind of turning point in my career, which was about two years ago, I was at an opening uh, of, of a show of mine down in Yorkville at a gallery I was with at the time. And it was just like so over the top. It was like in a movie, uh, a movie version of an incredibly successful art opening. I mean, the gallery was packed. There were waiters walking around with trays of wine. Um, you know, there, there was a velvet rope and a red carpet and people lined up outside the gallery waiting for the gallery to open. There was live music and paintings were flying off the wall. Um, and I, I just remember being there and kind of looking around and going, this, this was the dream. Um, this was so far beyond the dream um, and just kind of felt like pinching myself. Um, but in that same moment, something else kind of happened that was totally unexpected um, that's also changed my life. Because in that moment, I also felt, I don't know if the, the word isn't guilt, but in that moment, I, I just couldn't help but thinking of all those other artists uh, who shared the same dream as I had, uh, many of them friends of mine. Um, and just, you know, wondering about why had I been able to achieve this when so many didn't. Um, and I realized that there were a lot of things that I had done and learned um, that I could share with other artists. Um, and so that then became part of my mission. And uh, if any of you know Simon Sinek, he talks about, think about why. Why is the first thing you should think about, about why you want, what you want to do. And for me, my why, in terms of why I wanted to be a successful artist, was that was the only way I knew that I could just get up and paint every day. Uh, aside from winning the lottery, um, there was no way I was going to be able to spend every day in the studio unless I could find a way to earn a successful living. So that had been the focus for me of that entire kind of first 16 years when I left the police force. And at that moment, uh, at that gallery in Yorkville, my why shifted um, to include doing everything I could to try and help uh, other people achieve their dreams. Um, and so all of these videos that I'm putting out here, I started my YouTube channel, you know, I started to put some videos out there uh, and I thought this was going to be great. I was going to get you know, it had this huge impact. Uh, and my channel's been up for about two years now and hardly anything happened for the first year. Um, 
And then I realized, oh, I need to get involved in social media to promote the channel. So I started doing that a year ago and that's actually worked really well. And then just recently I realized that if I want the channel to really grow, uh, I need to post daily and I need to post a daily vlog. So that's what I'm doing now. But um, yeah, all of these videos that I'm doing now, I'm actually kind of um, directing them at my 19 year old self. Um, you know, when I had this dream of becoming a professional artist, um, now I finally achieved it after many, many years, um, but I wish I'd known everything I know now then. And so my mission uh, in life is to uh, share everything I've learned with uh, those other artists who share that same dream. So. I hope you find this helpful. Um, as usual, if you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up, uh, subscribe, uh, share it with your friends, and I welcome your comments and questions. I am Tim Packer, and thank you for your time.